When you turn back the clock and listen to what Malcolm X had to say, you can see that many of the things he talked about are still happening today. We are more than just athletes. We are more than just uh, shut up and dribble. James is teaming up with other athletes and entertainers launching a voting rights group. More than a vote isn't just about getting black Americans to the polls, but also identifying key cities and states to combat voter suppression. People are worshiping celebrities like LeBron James, like he is some kind of real leader. This superstar has used his platform to speak out on social and political matters. Well, Malcolm X predicted something like this was going to happen. Here's what he said about how this kind of activism would impact the community. I just told you a little while ago, these leaders that they call leaders, this included Lena Horne, this included Dick Gregory, and this included comedians, comics, trumpet players, baseball players. Show me in the white community where a comedian is a white leader. Show me in the white community where a singer is a white leader, or a dancer or a trumpet player is a white leader. These aren't leaders. These are puppets and clowns that uh, have been set up over the black community by the white community and have been made celebrities and usually say exactly what uh, they know that the white man wants to hear. But Malcolm predicted more than that. He predicted his own death, could have avoided it, but chose not to. No, I don't worry. I tell you, I'm a man who believed that I died 20 years ago and I live like a man who is dead already. I have no fear whatsoever of anybody or anything. He didn't die in a random act of violence or some freak accident. He died because he told the truth, nothing but the truth, whether people liked it or not. He challenged the norms, asked difficult questions, and was loved by many people. He didn't just rebel against white authority. He took that honesty beyond race and was determined to find the truth in every question. He was so ahead of his time that it was both scary and wonderful at the same time. But what really stands out from all his speeches is the fact that he gave us plenty of warnings of what is to come and we failed to see them. It's crazy how every word he said still holds weight today. In this documentary, we are going to take a closer look at the eight predictions Malcolm made. You can see how his words affected the community years ago and their impact in the 21st century. Starting off our list, we have media manipulation and bias. Hi, I'm Fox San Antonio's Jessica Headley. And I'm Ryan Wolf. Our, our greatest, greatest responsibility, responsibility is, is to, to serve, serve our, our Treasure Valley communities. The El Paso Las Cruces communities. Eastern Iowa communities. Mid-Michigan communities. We are extremely proud of the quality, balanced journalism that CBS4 News produces. But we are concerned about trouble and trying to be responsible, one-sided news stories playing in our country. We all know how the media works. The problem is that it works so well that after being bombarded with so much information, it is hard to figure out which news and stories are real and which ones manipulate the truth. Here's something Malcolm said. The media is the most powerful entity on earth. They have the power to make the innocent guilty and make the guilty innocent, and that's power. Because they control the minds of the masses, we can't deny that the media has the power to humiliate and glorify, destroy and exalt, distort and corrupt reality. Listen to this. When you have a revolution in the country, the first thing you take over is the radio. And then you start telling the people that everybody, the war is over. And, 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 and so all of them surrender. No, they believe that thing right there. And once they take that over, they start telling you uh, where you are and where they are and you fall right in line. It's plain thought control. The majority of the American people aren't segregationists. That the majority of the American people aren't imperialists. But the government is, the structure is, the power faction is. So what, how, how then do all the majority go along with it? Because those who sit in power over the television, over the radio, and over the press is constantly telling those who are the masses how free they are. Doesn't it sound familiar? The media has mastered manipulation. It is more interested in drama and pushing its own agenda than helping the community. They can tell one side of the story and leave out crucial details. They can choose what to show you, what matters, and what doesn't. Pro-Russia social media accounts are using false claims about so-called crisis actors to try to get people to doubt the credibility of important, accurate media reporting on what's going on in Ukraine. The media divides and conquers. Conservatives versus liberals, left wing versus right wing, black versus white, everything. Let's have a look at some of the posts that got the most attention. This is one of the most prolific. It's a video that was posted on TikTok showing a fire in an urban area. Some of the people who shared it said it showed attacks on Gaza. 
Others said it was filmed showing the Israeli skyline following a Hamas strike. Every story is used to emotionally engage the audience. They create a strong emotional response to draw people in, so they keep coming back for more. Because hatred, anger, and resentment are the easiest emotions to control. They can influence our opinions and shape our perceptions however they see fit. This is something Malcolm warned us about. Uh, well, just as uh, uh, in, the, in World War II, this country could use its uh, news media to propagandize and make, out, make the whole American public uh, love the love the Germans and the Japanese, rather love the Russians and the Chinese and hate the Germans and the Japanese. And then after the war, they changed it and made the American public love the, uh, the Germans and love the Japanese, hate the Russians and hate the Chinese, which shows that they can make the American public love whom they will and hate whom they will. And that same process can be used to re-educate the American public and show white people how to love black people and show black people how to do something to stand on our own feet and solve our own problems. The news can also be used to distract us from big events they don't want us to talk about. When we get immersed in the small things, we tend to forget some pressing issues that could easily be swept under the rug. The funny thing is that the media also distorted the true image of Malcolm X while he was active. It depicted him as a madman, fanatic, and a hater. They portrayed him as a black militant leader who advocated for a race war, while in reality, Malcolm wasn't a militant nor was he violent. He was a cultural revolutionary. He believed that black Americans had the right to defend themselves against oppression, tyranny, discrimination, and violence. He knew what life was like for black people because all of these things were something that he and everyone in his community lived with. They had scarred him throughout his entire life. He believed that nonviolent resistance would cost black people their lives. It was pointless to sit still when someone was beating you up or threatening your family. If you don't do something about it, then who will? I've never at any time made any statement that anybody can even interpret uh, to indicate that I believe in uh, initiating acts of aggression or violence indiscriminately against people. Uh, but I do believe when people are being oppressed and are the victims of brutality, that they are within their rights to defend themselves. When they defend themselves, in my opinion, this is not violence. This is self-defense. Back then, black people were told they had to conform in order to fit in. They had to become the model minority. Black women were expected to apply all sorts of things to their hair to straighten it so they could fit into this model. Black men and women were expected to be polite all the time, even when they were beaten and disrespected in the middle of the street. A regional black newspaper, he refused to run. They were yelling, run, Nick run and he only thing I heard him say I fought for my country in the war and I'm not running for from you and he didn't run he walked pictures of Alex Wilson are wired to every paper in the nation and around the world at the height of the Cold War the image of the United States as the defender of liberty is seriously tarnished we've been brainwashed since birth but it's time for us to take our power back and realize who we truly are. If you're ready to educate yourself and learn the information they never taught you in school, click the link in our bio to grab our new Hidden History Workbook. It includes 10 hidden black history stories that schools and the media purposefully kept hidden from us. This will only be available for a limited time. Click the link in our description to grab yours now for free. Malcolm changed everything. He literally reshaped how people saw themselves. There is this quote from James Cone the late author of Martin and Malcolm in America, that just explains this so perfectly. He said, Before Malcolm came along, we were all Negroes. After Malcolm, he helped us become black. Also, when we portray Malcolm as a symbol, many tend to overlook his complete identity. Some who promoted his movement's ideas and philosophy tried to erase his Muslim identity on purpose. Meanwhile, others who accepted his religious identity aimed to depoliticize him they downplayed his efforts and tried to get in his way. This is something Malcolm acknowledged. He said, For the Muslims, I am too worldly. For other groups, I am too religious. For militants, I am too moderate. For moderates, I am too militant. I feel like I am on a tightrope. Coming up next is police brutality and racial profiling. As a representative of the Nation of Islam, Malcolm used his position to talk about many socio-political problems. During that time, police brutality was widespread in Harlem just as it had been before 
and continued to be afterward. On April 26, 1957, at the corner of 125th Street and 7th Avenue, NYPD officers were beating up a young black man by the name of Reese Poe. Johnson X. Hinton, a member of the Nation of Islam, who just happened to be in the right place at the wrong time, yelled, You're not in Alabama. This is New York. So, the police battered him with nightsticks. Bloodied and beaten, he ended up in the 28th precinct. Malcolm didn't plan to sit and do nothing. He gathered a couple of hundred demonstrators who were angry about the whole thing, but remained disciplined. Malcolm demanded that Hinton receive treatment at Harlem Hospital, a request that was ultimately fulfilled. It was the start of a new type of relationship between black people and the police in New York. Malcolm stood up to the police and won. This was something that people would never forget. He knew that police brutality against black people was a national epidemic, but he wanted the rest of America and the world to know. So, he started talking about it more often. On April 27, 1962, officers in Los Angeles raided the Nation of Islam's temple number 27. They shot seven black Muslims and killed Ronald Stokes. The police told the news they thought the men who carried clothes were criminals. This event catapulted Malcolm into the middle of a national controversy against police violence. He turned Stokes into a figure in the struggle for black freedom. But what you may not know is that Malcolm X also predicted our modern police state. The police are able to use the press to make the white public think that 90% or 99% of the Negroes in the Negro community are criminals. And once the white public is convinced that most of the Negro community is a criminal element, then this automatically paves the way for the police to move into the Negro community, exercising Gestapo tactics, stopping any black man who is in the, on, on the sidewalk, whether he is guilty or whether he is innocent, whether he is well-dressed or whether he is poorly dressed, whether he is educated or whether he is dumb, whether he's a Christian or whether he's a Muslim, as long as he is black and a member of the Negro community, the white public thinks that the white policeman is justified in going in there and trampling on that man's civil rights and on that man's human rights. Yes, this was almost 60 years ago, and it is still a problem today. Every event speaks for itself. Shots fired, mail down, um, black mail, maybe 20, um, black revolver, black handgun. Tamir Rice, who was 12 years old, died later in hospital. The killing of George Floyd sparked worldwide protests against racism and the excessive use of force by police. The more black and brown people get killed or beaten by law enforcement officers, the more outraged the public becomes. The death of George Floyd has sparked similar scenes across Europe and beyond. In Australia, organizers say tens of thousands of protesters gathered, some highlighting what they say is the mistreatment of the country's indigenous population. Mariana! In Brazil, demonstrators carried banners reading Black Lives Matter. They protested against the killing of hundreds of black people, mainly in the favelas of Rio de Janeiro. In the late 20th century, the United States saw a huge increase in its criminal justice system. But this also meant that a lot of those who were incarcerated were from minorities, especially the black community. By 2000, even though black people made up only around 13% of the American population, they made up almost 50% of the state prison population. While some adjustments to sentencing and corrections policies have been made over the past 20 years, the rate of imprisonment for black adults in 2020 remained five times higher than that for white adults. According to a recent survey, 41% of black people in the US stated that they were detained or stopped by law enforcement just because of their race. About 21% of black adults, as well as 30% of black men, stated they were victims of police brutality. This is such a big problem that children are being taught how to behave in front of the police, the hate they might encounter, and what that would mean for their safety. Black parents call it the talk. We actually have a line that we do at our house. We practice this thing. What is it? I'm Ariel Sky Williams. I'm eight years old. I'm unarmed and I have nothing that will hurt you. Parents are afraid for their children and the possibility of them having a deadly interaction with the police. They are afraid their children might end up like Michael Brown, Freddie Gray, and Eric Garner. Another thing Malcolm warned us about, global solidarity against oppression. Malcolm showed us that solidarity is the greatest power of all. 
For the first time in our history here, you find we have a tendency to want to come together. For the first time, we have a tendency to want to work together. And up to now, no organization on the American continent has tried to unite you and me with our brothers and sisters back home. At no time, none of us. Marcus Garvey did it, they put him in jail. They framed him, the government. Framed him, they put him in jail. Marcus Garvey tried. The only fear that exists is that you and I, once we get united, will also unite with our brothers and sisters. And you know we've got to unite with them because there are 700 million Muslims. And we sure need to stop being the minority and become part of the majority. But to understand his impact, we need to take a look at how he expressed his support for Palestinians after his pilgrimage to Mecca. For many black people today, the link between Palestinian liberation and black liberation might feel worlds apart. But historically, they have worked together, resisted, and theorized alongside each other. During the early 1960s, Palestinians were dealing with the aftermath of the formation of the State of Israel in 1948. Hundreds of thousands of Palestinians were displaced, which created a massive refugee crisis. From 1947 to 1949, around 750,000 Palestinians out of 1.9 million people were forced to leave their homes. Zionist forces took over 78% of what was historically Palestine. They destroyed and ethnically cleansed hundreds of cities and villages. Around 15,000 Palestinians died in many mass killings, as well as over 70 massacres. These circumstances struck a chord with many black Americans who were involved in the civil rights movement and fought against segregation and the legacy that slavery left behind. Their similarities were rooted in a desire for self-determination and a history of oppression. In 1964, Malcolm X wrote a now famous essay on Zionist logic. He talked about how Zionism, Judaism, and colonialism, when combined together, created a very dangerous situation that mirrored the struggles of black communities. Here's how he started the essay. The modern 20th century weapon of neo-imperialism is dollarism. The Zionists have mastered the science of dollarism, the ability to come posing as a friend and benefactor, bearing gifts, and all other forms of economic aid and offers of technical assistance. Thus, the power and influence of Zionist Israel in many of the newly independent African nations has fast become even more unshakable than that of the 18th century European colonialists. And this new kind of Zionist colonialism differs only in form and method, but never in motive or objective. Malcolm wrote that many European nations and former colonial powers played a key role in setting up Israel. First, he talked about the location. Israel was positioned in a way that, strategically speaking, helped divide the Arab world. It also has control over the Gulf of Aqaba, which is critical for shipping and trade routes in the Red Sea. On top of that, Israel has access to the Mediterranean Sea. Malcolm said that Israel's presence in the area allowed the Zionists to use a colonial strategy. This is what Malcolm said in his own words. And the continued low standard of living in the Arab world has been skillfully used by the Zionist propagandists to make it appear to the Africans that the Arab leaders are not intellectually or technically qualified to lift the living standard of their people, thus indirectly inducing Africans to turn away from the Arabs and towards the Israelis for teachers and technical assistance. At that time, the United Nations passed important resolutions like Resolution 194, Palestinian refugees could finally go back to where their families had lived. This resolution became a global framework for the Palestinian cause. The last time Malcolm went to Palestine in 1964, he received a warm welcome. He visited hospitals and refugee camps to get a clear picture of what was really going on. This is what motivated him to write the essay. He encouraged African leaders to take a stand and support the Palestinians' fight for freedom. This is why many African-American radical figures like Robert F. Williams, Eldridge Cleaver, and Kwame Ture got involved in the movement. In 2023, the world rallied once again in solidarity with Palestinians and condemned Israel's war. Israel's war on Gaza has galvanized support for Palestinians around the globe, all across Europe, from Sweden to Germany, and in Spain. Millions around the world mobilized in solidarity with the Palestinians trying to survive the brutal Israeli attacks. The protest included many Jewish people in London. Protests were held in Tokyo, Tehran, Tunis, Manila, London, Milan, Karachi, 
Beirut, Kazan City, and many more. Next on our list is Political Empowerment of Minorities. Malcolm predicted the importance of political empowerment for marginalized communities, especially black people. He foresaw that huge changes had to be made if minorities would ever stand a chance at politics. When Malcolm expressed his opinion on why nonviolence would never work against racism and segregation, he said that nonviolence makes a man defenseless. Uh, Reverend Martin Luther King preaches a doctrine of nonviolent insistence upon the rights of the American Negro. What is your attitude toward the, this the, philosophy? The white man pays Reverend Martin Luther King, subsidizes Reverend Martin Luther King, so that Reverend Martin Luther King can continue to teach the Negroes to be defenseless. That's what you mean by nonviolent. Be defenseless. Be defenseless in the face of one of the most cruel uh, beasts that has ever taken the people into captivity. That's this American white man. And they have proved it throughout the country by the police dogs and the police clubs. A uh, hundred years ago, they used to put on a white sheet and use a bloodhound against Negroes. Today they have taken off the white sheet and put on police uniforms. They've uh, traded in the bloodhounds for police dogs, and they're still doing the same thing. And just as Uncle Tom, back during slavery, used to keep the Negroes from resisting the bloodhound or resisting the Ku Klux Klan by teaching them to, to love their enemy or pray for those who use them despitefully, today uh, Martin Luther King is just a 20th century or modern Uncle Tom or a religious Uncle Tom who is doing the same thing today to keep Negroes defenseless in the face of attack that Uncle Tom did on the plantation to keep those Negroes defenseless in the, in the face of the attack of the Klan in that day. He also explained that the American political and economic system is incapable of creating equality and justice for all. Back then, he voiced his opinions on well-known black politicians, such as Congressman William Dawson and Adam Clayton Powell. He said that passing laws to end segregation would not be enough to give minorities the freedom and success they deserve. In fact, Malcolm believed the only way to enforce the civil rights legislation would be with a police state. When he came back from Mecca, he told the world exactly what he thought about leaders such as John F. Kennedy and Abraham Lincoln. He called them deceitful. He also believed that Eleanor Roosevelt and Franklin Delano Roosevelt could have done more for African Americans while they were still in power. Now, I think that the guilt complex of the American white man is so profound until when you begin to analyze the real condition of the black man in America, instead of the American white man eliminating the causes that create that condition, he tries to cover it up by accusing his accusers of teaching hate. But actually, they're just exposing him for being responsible for what exists. Malcolm recognized that the power structures in the United States favor the white man, the majority, and believed that true change could only come if minorities were actively involved in the political process in their own community. This is the black nationalism theory. Over time, Malcolm X's predictions have manifested to some extent. Today, we can see a lot of black people and minorities in politics, including local, state, and federal government positions. These diverse perspectives help create a more inclusive political landscape. But even though a lot has changed, some problems still remain, like voter suppression, gerrymandering, and systemic barriers. Vote suppression has an ugly and long history in the United States. During the past two decades, states have placed barriers that blocked access to the ballot box for many people. They cut voting times, imposed stricter voter ID laws, limited registration opportunities, and purged voter rolls. Rights Act of 1965 tried to eliminate them. But in 2013, Supreme Court case Shelby County v. Holder rolled back a lot of these protections, especially in southern states. In a 5-4 to four decision, Chief Justice John Roberts wrote that the law was based on decades-old data and eradicated practices, and that there was no longer such a disparity for communities of color. Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg famously dissented, that's like throwing away your umbrella in a rainstorm because you're not getting wet. Since that decision, 25 states, many in the South, have put in place new voter restrictions like ID requirements and cutbacks in early voting. And despite the many gains, black women are still underrepresented in politics. They are also not supported and recruited in white districts to the same level as their white counterparts. These are the obstacles that ethnic and racial minorities struggle with. It doesn't mean you can't get into politics. It is just very hard to do so. Another thing Malcolm warned us about is the use of education as a powerful tool for self-improvement. Malcolm always wanted to become a lawyer. It was his dream for as long as he could remember, but life led him on a different path. Even though he was 15 when he dropped out of school, he had a lot of faith in the power of education. It's going to use the prove that you can uh, use new legislation and change the conditions that our people face in the South. 
So instead of legislation, in my opinion, it takes education. The, the whites have to be re-educated uh, so that the racism that they have in their heart can be eliminated and, the, and our people have to be re-educated uh, so that we will know how to do something for ourselves instead of waiting for others to do it for us all the time. Throughout the autobiography, he mentioned that he had many friends and associates in Harlem and Boston who had remarkable educational potential. But the reason they, including himself, couldn't achieve their full potential was because of the country's history of racism, oppression, slavery, and discrimination. The education system back then was primarily catered to the needs of the dominant race. It is what put millions of black people at the bottom of American society. Malcolm knew that education could be used as a tool for liberation. But what he didn't like was the fact that some black people got a degree just to improve their social status and personal benefit. Malcolm advocated for an education that would go beyond just training people. Education wasn't meant only for the privileged, but for everyone. Going to school wasn't just about learning your ABCs. It was the passport to the future, a lifelong opportunity to learn more and respect different traditions and cultures. For Malcolm, education should be useful and practical for black people, especially in their fight for liberation. When people are able to learn, they become more aware of how different political, social, economic, and psychological factors influence their lives in the country. And those black people who were lucky enough to get a degree were now responsible for sharing their knowledge with the community as a way of giving back. This way, they could give the masses a sense of purpose and a reason to press on. It would help the community a lot if they saw examples of high achievers who were black. We know that Malcolm regretted that he didn't go to university or college. He educated himself while he was still in prison. He read books on different subjects and memorized the dictionary to be able to express himself better. Because he was so well read, he was able to hold any conversation, debate on any topic, and make himself heard and understood. He was once asked what his alma mater was, and he said, books. They satisfied his curiosity. As the country continues to deal with the problem of racial injustice, many Americans still think that black and white people have equal opportunities to access a good education, any job they are qualified for, or get affordable housing. But a recent survey shows that's not entirely true. The number of people who say that these opportunities are equally available to both racial groups has reached its lowest levels in the last 30 years. Each group has seen a decrease of about 6% or 7%. There is more. When people were asked if they thought black children had equal chances of getting a good education as white children in their community, the numbers were just mind-blowing. Check this out. The first survey from 1962 showed that 83% of all Americans believed that both white and black children had an equal opportunity to receive proper education in their communities. This perception remained at 75% or higher until 2016, when it dropped to 71%. Since then, it has declined even further to an all-time low of 64%. There is also this stark contrast in how white and black adults think. We can see that white people have a more positive outlook on things compared to the black community. Coming up next is Importance of Grassroots Movements Malcolm was a community organizer, a grassroots organizer. His influence skyrocketed, and his impact can still be felt today. The motive of a revolution, the objective of a revolution, and the result of a revolution, and the methods used in a revolution, you may change words, you may devise another program, you may change your goal, and you may change your mind. Look at the American Revolution in 1776. That revolution was for what? For land. How was it, why did they want land? Independence. How was it carried out? Bloodshed. Number one, it was based on land. The basis of independence. And the only way they could get it was bloodshed. While Malcolm was alive, he set the groundwork for organizations like the Black Panther Party and the East Organization, so his influence and work continued to be felt in the 21st century. He challenged people to think outside the box and beyond the power structure that they could see before them. Many black people and activists tried to unlock empathy within the white community. They wanted white Americans to see them as human beings and understand that violence was not the way. But Malcolm focused on something else. He tried to unlock the collective imagination of the black community. He believed that with this kind of approach, they would have better chances of success. So when you see things like 
free health clinics to the Black Panther Party, that's the Malcolm X mandate. We keep us safe. When RNA is struggling to control land, that's the Malcolm X mandate. When the East organization is opening up Black liberation schools, that's because they are the ideological children of Malcolm X. And our movement today are their ideological children. So we owe it all. We really wouldn't be able to make these bold demands like defund the police if we didn't have this ancestry that told us, don't make those reformist demands. Don't tinker around the edges. Don't think about what the current power structures are and those limitations make the big ask. There's so much of our history they hid from us, which is how they keep us stuck, broke, and confused. For those ready to educate yourself on who you truly are and learn the history they never taught us in school, we just released a free hidden history workbook. It includes 10 hidden black history stories that schools purposefully kept hidden from us. Click the link in our description to grab yours now. You have nothing to lose. It's free. Grassroots campaigns are incredibly popular. They continue to increase public awareness and build a name for themselves. They do that by using different strategies. They hand out flyers, put up posters, or go door to door. They collect signatures for petitions, raise money for marketing, and organize large-scale marches and rallies. When things get out of control, grassroots movements now have the power to make bold claims like defunding the police or releasing political prisoners. The reason is simple. People want a safety net they can rely on, not a system that can harm them. So organizations are fighting to give power to the people and free those who've been criminalized for their activism. Another thing Malcolm predicted was his own death. He knew he was a marked man. He was shot 21 times. I heard shots, and I saw people crawling on the floor. I saw, and so I got down too. Then when I was looking out, and I saw um, someone look in amazement to the front. I knew they had shot my husband. He sustained one shot in the lower right chin, and the other six hit him in the chest and uh, fire. Malcolm wasn't a journalist and didn't plan to make an autobiography about himself. His publishers, including Alex Haley, were the ones who asked him if they could write a story on his behalf. Malcolm didn't want to glorify himself as other people usually did, but he did allow Haley to interview him about his life as a hustler, prisoner, minister, and black nationalist. Haley wrote everything down, word to word, as if Malcolm was the one writing it. But as the publishing schedule came to a close, Malcolm said something that Haley could never forget. I would show him chapters as they were finished in tentative states. And then finally, the manuscript was there. And I went down to New York and um, Malcolm went over the whole of the manuscript. And he'd make alterations here and there with his red ballpoint pen. I can see it going now. And uh, then he said to me, brother, I don't think I'm going to live to read this in print. And uh, then it was sent to the publisher. And he was very prophetic. It was less than two weeks later he was shot to death in the Ottoman ball. He predicted that black Muslim leaders were going to kill him because he said, and I quote, I know where the bodies are buried. Malcolm explained that when he was young, he thought he would die a horrible death. He believed he would meet the same fate as his father and other black men before him. After he came back from Mecca, something in him changed. Before the trip, he was completely against white America, which was something that worked well with the Nation of Islam. But during his pilgrimage, he saw what true Islam was like and how it was meant to unify people of all colors. He wrote, America needs to understand Islam because this is the one religion that erases from its society the race problem. He added, I could see from this that perhaps if white Americans could accept the oneness of God, then perhaps too, they could accept in reality the oneness of man and cease to measure and hinder and harm others in terms of their differences in color. So he left the Nation of Islam, though still a Muslim, because of the rigid teachings. He wanted to establish a black nationalist party that could work together with civil rights actions. Through efforts such as these, he would be able to take the political consciousness of black people to a whole new level. 
Malcolm firmly believed that the system was designed in a way that it might tolerate black leaders, but only if they stayed in the ghettos. If they try to mobilize a force outside the ghetto in any way, shape, or form, then they will be crushed. He added that most of the white people who were in committees didn't want to see a black man in the same position as they were in. It was this superiority system that puts these people in a position of power. The, 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 the system of government that America has consists of committees. There are 16 senatorial committees that govern the country and uh, 20 congressional committees. Ten of the 16 uh, senatorial committees are in the hands of Southern racialist senators who are racialists. Thirteen of the twenty, about this was before the last election, I think it's even more so now. Uh, ten of the sixteen committees, senatorial committees, are in the hands of senators who are southern racialists. Thirteen of the twenty congressional committees were in the hands of uh, southern congressmen who are racialists. Which means out of the thirty-six committees that govern the uh, foreign and domestic direction of that government, twenty-three are in the hands of southern racialists. Men who in no way believe in the equality of man. The way he described the two-party system is still up for debate. He compares them to wolves and foxes. They are of the same breed, but the main difference is that the wolf will show its teeth when it's ready to attack. But when the fox shows its teeth, it seems to be smiling, as if plotting something. And it was at this moment that people started making death threats. He became more independent, powerful, and even more convinced that he was going to get brutally murdered. Many speculate that the Nation of Islam was behind the assassination, but other conspiracy theories still persist to this day. Haley said that even though Malcolm predicted his death, he still kept working on the autobiography. He wanted the people to know what the black community went through, and he wanted the world to see how he tried to fight racism. Malcolm told Haley that he saw agents following him everywhere, and it was a matter of time before they took his life. When someone firebombed his house, he publicly announced that it was the Nation of Islam who did it. But in another interview with Haley, he said he wasn't that sure that the Nation of Islam was behind it, but he was in no doubt that he would get killed by either the NOI or the FBI, or both. When they killed him, they could never kill his words, because the next thing he predicted is truly eye-opening. It was the legacy after his death. Malcolm predicted that the press and the white community would continue to write him off as a violent radical and hateful militant long after he was dead. He saw it coming because it served a purpose. That way, white people would never have to confront their own violence and hatred. It would be easier to discredit some of his ideas and activism than to challenge the status quo. Compared to other activists, Malcolm was brutally honest. This is what made him so unique. Bring about the complete independence of people of African descent here in the Western Hemisphere and first here in the United States and bring about the freedom of these people by any means necessary. But there was another thing that Malcolm warned us about that we failed to see. He believed he would become more important in death than in life. Fast forward to today, people constantly draw inspiration from what he said. He died in 1965, but his self-determination and black pride continue to resonate. For example, in 1969, his speeches inspired black soldiers to form GIs united against the Vietnam War. And even long after he was gone, black activists and black power advocates continued to fight for equality and justice. They didn't just settle for integration, they demanded economic, cultural, and political power so that black people could decide their own futures. Malcolm X is truly a legend and will never be forgotten.